This is lesson five, utilitarianism and the course Living Ethical Lives. The last four lessons have focused on uh, the basic parameters of ethical reflection. The next four, four lessons will explore some of the major philosophical options for moral reflection. Each will be defined uh, and its limitations discussed. Uh, first, the objectives for, for this particular lesson. By the end, you should uh, be able to define utilitarianism, define the three major types of utilitarianism, apply the principle of utilitarianism uh, to conflicts of duty, understand the limitations of utilitarianism. First, let's uh, start with the motivator. Kathy is a third grade student in Mrs. Frank's class. Kathy is an above average student who finds it difficult to concentrate while her teacher is talking. This is partly because she is fairly bright and partly because she is young. Whenever Mrs. Franks corrects Kathy for being too loud, she says, now Kathy, you need to be quiet because no one around you can hear me if you are talking. The lesson Kathy is being taught is that her need to talk is not as important as the need of the whole class to listen. Finally, one day when Mrs. Franks requests that Kathy be quiet and tells her again that those around her cannot hear her while she is talking, the third grader speaks up and asks her teacher, why are they more important than me? This is a good question to ask, even if it comes from a third grader. Why should my rights be less important than the class as a whole? When, if ever, are my rights to be considered above the rights of the whole? Can we ever be happy without regarding the concerns of others? And can happiness be an appropriate moral end? Well, let's get into the lecture. So let's start with the basic definition of utilitarianism. The entire theory is based upon the greatest happiness principle. It is the attempt to define everything in terms of utility. Here, the assertion is that this is the supreme and undivided sovereignty of the principle. The attempt is to discover some calculus or process of moral arithmetic by means of which uniform results will arise. Utilitarianism became influential with the work of Jeremy Bentham, who defined utility in terms of pleasure and pain. According to Bentham, we should act in such a way as to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. This position is known as hedonistic or quantitative utilitarianism. Here we are talking about overall pleasure and pain. Sometimes this is called pig's philosophy. John Stuart Mill uh, sought to revise the emphasis on sensual pleasure made by Bentham. He emphasized happiness instead of pleasure. This is called uh, eudemonistic or qualitative utilitarianism. This is a significant advance over Bentham. Happiness or pleasure can be characterized in the following way. Intensity, pleasure or happiness should be as strong as possible. Duration, pleasure and happiness that lasts longer is generally better. Certainty, pleasure and happiness we are certain to enjoy is better. Remoteness, pleasure, happiness that can be uh, enjoyed immediately is better. And fruitfulness, the likelihood the pleasure or happiness will be followed by similar pleasures. Purity, the likelihood of the pleasure or happiness not being followed by their opposite. Extent, the number to whom the pleasure or happiness extends. These characteristics help make the point that pleasure or happiness envisioned by utilitarianism is more about the momentary satisfaction rather is about enduring pleasure or happiness. Utilitarianism is a teleological moral theory. That is, it assesses the morality of any action in light of its capacity to engender the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. It also tends to level all moral agents and assume no one has any moral claim uh, that, than anyone else. In other words, my happiness is no more important that, than another person's happiness. What matters is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. 
The various interpretations of utility, let's explore that a little more now. Hedonistic utilitarianism emphasizes pleasure. It is also called quantitative utilitarianism. Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism, who I mentioned before, held this view. Eudaimonistic utilitarianism, and you might pronounce that another way, but it emphasizes happiness. It is also called qualitative utilitarianism. John Stuart Mill held this view. Ideal utilitarianism emphasizes the ideal of justice and freedom. This type of utilitarianism attempts to capture utility in an ideal that renders a greater good to the whole. Other types of utilitarianism include act utilitarianism. Now, this type of utilitarianism appeals directly to the principle of utility. Moral virtue or action arises from this principle. The crucial question becomes, what effect will my action have on the capacity for a the greatest number to have pleasure or happiness. General utilitarianism, now this type is of utilitarianism, utilitarianism is less concerned with action as an act utilitarianism than defining the general parameters for morality. General utilitarianism wants to talk in terms of more or less universal parameters. The crucial question becomes, what would happen if everyone were to do the such and such in a particular situation. Rule utilitarianism emphasizes the centrality of rules in morality. We determine our rules by asking which rules will promote the greatest general good for everyone. Pleasure and utility are not the only possible standards of utility, and the 20th century saw attempts to redefine the standard of utility in terms of ideal goods such as freedom and knowledge and justice. This according to G.E. Moore. Peter Singer is a well-known ethicist who argues for the moral status of animals from a utilitarian point of view. This is a case in one of his best-known books titled Animal Liberation. In this book, Singer thinks that most people are guilty of what he calls speciesism. That is, simply to recognize the moral status of one species but not that of others. He thinks this happens when human beings do not consider the rights of lower life forms. He thinks it is a wrong to consider all human life as more important than the life of all animals. This view is utilitarianism in the sense that it attempts to level all rights, human and non-human. It is also utilitarian in that it questions whether the disregard for the rights of all non-human life contributes to some greater good. He specifically questions whether the amount of animal experimentation actually creates a greater good, that is, one that is both pure and extends to enough people. Singer's argument is, is clearly utilitarian, but it fails a crucial test for theological ethics. A central Christian conviction concerns the status of human beings in the sight of God as made in his image. This places particular stress upon the moral responsibility of human beings to be stewards of the non-human and larger biotic world, but it refuses uh, to level human life. This means while a Christian may embrace Singer's intention to consider the moral status of animals, he or she will do so in a much different manner. For example, a Christian can oppose animal experimentation, but will do so based upon a concern for needless suffering and little measurable benefit. While this is clearly teleological little benefit, it is not utilitarian in that it does not level the moral status between humans and animals. Let's look at things that command utilitarianism. Uh, the concern for the whole makes a great deal of uh, sense. It makes sense to consider the whole when making decisions. When this is done, any sacrifice a person makes can be justified in light of the larger good produced by it. For example, when we make decisions as parents for the good of the family, we are able to sacrifice for the children or for the whole of the family. Therefore, the family participates in a greater good. This would be the same principle at stake when one participates in a health insurance group. 
We may pay more than we need in one year, but by doing so, <clears throat> those who did need it were able to receive the treatment. This way of looking at things offers general rules. Now, this view is more connected to rule utilitarianism, but it suggests the point of utilitarianism is not to prescribe particular actions. What utilitarianism does is define a larger trajectory, the greatest happiness principle, by which more decisions can be made. Since there appears to be an inherent good at stake in the greatest happiness principle, it is possible for this logic to guide our actions without prescribing them. A long history is attached to moral theology. Since utilitarianism is a teleological view, it requires the active engagement of morally sensitive people in order to provide a sufficient basis for moral reflection. An interest in consequences will contribute to the environment necessary for moral reflection. Therefore, those things that commend all moral teleology tend to recommend utilitarianism. Now, things that suggest the limitations of utilitarianism. First, happiness can only be a, an elusive quality. Happiness can easily become quantitative uh, rather than qualitative if we use the meaning Aristotle assigns to happiness as self-fulfillment and further understand that virtue is required, then the moral quality of happiness may be secured. But happiness can become an end unto itself, and in fact, it tends to lend itself to such excess. Ideal utilitarianism is less guilty of this limitation, but even here the ideal of justice or freedom can quickly become empty of any distinct meaning. Happiness, as it is usually interpreted by its proponents, is limited in its capacity to provide direction for moral reflection. Therefore, the basic limitation of happiness as it is defined and employed by utilitarianism is too elusive a concept to be of much use for moral reflection. Again, the greatest happiness is difficult, if not impossible, to calculate. While it seems to be an intuitive argument that the greatest happiness principle is better than less happiness, this is not the case. How is one to go about calculating greatest happiness in particular ways? How is one to understand a particular moral conflict in light of greatest happiness? It appears that greatest happiness, even when it is qualified by intensity, duration, certainty, etc., is nearly meaningless as a vehicle for moral decision making. The leveling of all moral claims cannot be finally sustained. That the desire to count all persons' happiness on an equal plane appears to be morally indisputable is not the case. Almost without exception, the leveling of moral claims when attached to the greatest happiness principle will lead either to the complete break, breakdown of moral reflection or to the inordinate sacrifice by some group. Regarding the breakdown of moral reflection, it would mean that in an effort to secure the happiness of the greatest number of people, it would ultimately frustrate moral reflection by the enormity of the criterion. Regarding the inordinate sacrifice of some group, it would be logical to assume the greatest happiness principle requires some unhappiness or lack of pleasure for some group. And this would naturally fall to a group that has little voice. While arguments could be advanced toward both of these criticisms, it is not possible to dismiss them. Therefore, the leveling of moral claims is a limitation for utilitarianism. Well, let's look back and review this lesson. Uh, it has attempted to, or I have attempted in this lesson, to define one of the major philosophical options for moral reflection. We have looked specifically at the definition of utilitarianism as a moral theory uh, devoted to the greatest happiness of the most people, uh, the three major types of utilitarianism, that is quantitative, qualitative, and ideal, how utilitarian principles can be applied to moral conflicts, it applies teleologically to moral problems, and the limitations of utilitarianism, that is happiness can be elusive, greatest happiness principle uh, may be impossible to calculate and the leveling of all moral claims may not be possible. Let me close this lesson with a thought. Uh, 
The writer of Proverbs says, Wisdom is a fountain of life to one who has it, but folly is the punishment of fools. The mind of the wise makes their speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to their lips. That's in Proverbs 16, 22 through 23. The writer intends to say wisdom will bless the life of a person, and in this flourishing, the blessing will widen to others. Therefore, wisdom, in the mind of the writer of Proverbs, is both personal and social. As one thinks about utilitarianism and its hope uh, for the larger whole, it is of some significance to consider if the scriptural tradition is not much richer in its capacity to engender the greatest happiness.